Welcome to Inside the Box. Today we're going to review one of our favorite games, A Game of Thrones, the card game by Fantasy Flight. Designed as a CCG by Eric Lang in 2002, it was later converted into a living card game in 2007 and still regularly releases expansions, retaining an active and loyal following. Having completed his masterpiece, Eric Lang then went on to design the Star Wars LCG, where Han Solo can punch TIE fighters out of orbit for some reason. At any rate, A Game of Thrones the card game is the polar opposite of the Star Wars one. From the gameplay mechanics to the individual cards, everything about this game is well thought out and an absolute flavor win, perfectly matching the spirit and tone of the source material. Since the game came out in 2002, you might realize that it's based on the book series, not the TV series. So if you're just a fan of the show, you might notice that some of the characters' names are different and that they look like the book versions, not the show versions. Which unfortunately means you'll have to deal with hideously deformed, noseless book Tyrion instead of gazing lovingly at Peter Dinklage's gorgeous face. What? He's a handsome dude, I can admit that. Now there is a version of the game that was licensed by HBO and includes stills from the TV series instead of the original art. Although the game is fundamentally the same, the HBO version is a two-player only variant and isn't fully compatible with the regular game. Many cards are different than their LCG counterparts, the rules are a bit simplified, and the card backs are different. For only $10 more, you can get the real version, which includes four pre-constructed decks instead of two, and allows you to delve as deeply into the game as you wish by adding on any of the numerous expansions available. It's a much better value. So don't be lured into buying the light HBO version just because you're a fan of the show and want a small version of Peter Dinklage that you can carry around with you and look at and, and touch whenever you want. The hell? What? Each player in Game of Thrones chooses one of six houses to play as. Each house has its own strengths and weaknesses, and they all play pretty differently from one another, some focusing on subterfuge and manipulation, while others focus on outright war. Wait, you're playing Greyjoy now? I thought you liked Targaryens. Yeah, but he makes a better Daenerys. So. Okay. Anyone know what's going on with Matt? I texted him to come play, but he's been super flaky recently. He's dead, remember? Oh yeah. Well, we need a fourth. Hmm. Gamer sense. Tingly. Well, I guess we could just do three player. Jesus, where did you come from? I sensed you needed me. I'll play. But you didn't even watch the show. I'll figure it out. This is Westeros, the pinnacle of the civilized world. What's over there? Horse-eating savage is not important. So, I'm House Stark, the Wardens of the North. Uh, Brandon is House Targaryen, the exiled former rulers of the land. Bow to your Khaleesi! And your house... Tentacle porn? Uh, here, you can be the Lannisters. That's the house with Peter Dinklage. Did you put your face on there? You're supposed to. No? Each player's goal in Game of Thrones is to collect a total of 15 power tokens representing your house's influence in Westeros. Power is initially earned from the central pool, but can also be stolen from other players in power challenges, creating a cutthroat war for political dominance. There are four basic card types in the game. Characters make up the meat of the game by attacking and defending. With over 70 expansions released so far, you can pretty much find multiple versions of all your favorite characters. Location cards represent various places in the known world and help you build resources or perform special actions. Attachments are played onto other cards and can be things like weapons, ailments, or companions. So, wait, a dire wolf is an attachment? How does that work? Do you, like, staple it onto the dude or... Uh, wait, no. That actually did happen. See? Flavor win! <laughs> and event cards have special effects that are used once and then discarded. You know, Timmy, 
One of the coolest yet simplest mechanics Lane came up with for this game is the concept of kneeling. Kneeling? What's that? I'm glad you asked. You see, a card in play can exist in two states. Standing or kneeling. That's awesome! That's technological progress. By using a simple change in orientation, a card can be shown as in use. Wow, that opens up a huge range of gameplay possibilities. But it seems kind of familiar, though. <laughs> Shut up, Jimmy. Okay, so the first thing you do is draw your opening hand of seven cards. And from there, you can choose up to five gold worth of cards and start the game within the play. Oh, that's cool. So it gets the game off to a fast start rather than just a slow build-up. Okay, I'm going to play Shay, Lannisport Brothel, and Dockside Brothel. Is this deck nothing but whores? It's a Tyrion-themed deck. I call it Tits and Wine. It's mostly tits. Okay, so I'll get Advisor to the Crown, and I'll attach Dragon Lore to it. That's worrying. Mm, why are you worried? You're immune to fire, aren't you? No. Uh, yeah, you should be worried then. Okay, so next everyone chooses their plots. In addition to your main deck, each player also constructs a separate seven card plot deck. Plots are one of the mechanics that really make this game unique. At the beginning of every round, each player chooses and reveals a plot. Plots determine for that round how much gold resources a player gets, the turn order, and how strong a player's attacks are. Most plots also have an immediate effect when revealed, or an ongoing effect that lasts for the duration of the turn. Plots allow you to reliably access toolkit abilities like deck searching or board wipes, giving your overall strategy more consistency than a traditional card game. Okay, so Brandon has the highest initiative this round, so he plays first. So starting with him, we each choose titles. Each of these figures represents a position on the small council that confers special benefits that affect combat or provide extra resources. They also determine the relationships between players for that round. For example, if your title supports another player's, you can't initiate challenges against them. If your title opposes another player, you get extra benefits for attacking them. I'll be the master of fisting. That's the hand of the king. I'll take master law. Nerd. Uh, okay, I'll just take the title that supports you then, Hannah. Oh, that's so sweet. I won't attack you either, okay? That's gaming with a married couple for you. You want to team up against them? Silence, plebeian. Okay, I get five gold, and I'll play Daenerys Targaryen. I will kneel my master with the dragon lore, so I can play Drogon for free. Prepare to meet Fiery Wrath. Prepare to meet Bottomless Vagina. I use my whore to kneel your dragon and keep him from attacking this turn. Wow, she must be some whore. How does that even work? That's not to think about it. Do dragons even have genitals? They're kind of like birds and reptiles, right? So maybe they have a cloaca. Mm, what's that? It's like a single orifice for urination, defecation, egg laying, and copulation. Oh, like a piss shit fuckhole. Why didn't you just say that? So, now we come to the meat of the game. Combat. See the colored icons in the lower left side of each character? They correspond to the three different types of challenges you can initiate. Red is a military battle. Green is intrigue. And blue is a vie for political power. You can initiate one of each type of challenge each round, and only characters with the corresponding icons can attack or block in them. So warriors battle warriors while schemers take on schemers rather than just shoving a sword in everyone's hand and sending them out into the battlefield. That's actually really cool. Yeah, and that allows them to not have to balance each character's strength against one another, so you can have a character like Littlefinger be really strong in intrigue and politics, but not be able to compete in military conflicts. And each type of challenge also produces different outcomes. If a defender loses a military challenge, characters are killed, while intrigue challenges force them to discard cards, and power attacks let the attacker steal the all-important power tokens. Sweetheart, if you want to attack Brandon, my title supports you, so I can block for you in case George tries to, like, mess you up afterwards. Okay, I'll power attack House Targaryen. There you go. Haha, <laughs> first blood. Next turn. Okay, my plot is building season, so I choose an opponent, and then we both get to search our decks for a location. Uh, you can search with me. I will get... Winterfell. You can't just always favor your wife. Look at the game state. Hey, in Westeros, marriage is often used to politically ally houses. So you know what? Flavor win for us, right? Yeah, you know what else marriage is used for in Westeros? Murder. Red wedding, cocksuckers! I'll get it. 
Okay. Hey, it's the box! How'd the box get out there? It's, uh, it's for Hana. There you go. Two House Greyjoy. Box. Get it? Theon! <laughs> I don't know who any of these people are! What makes a Game of Thrones gameplay great is as the game goes on, rounds get bigger and swingier, culminating in epic battles that feel like an appropriate climax to a powerful story. In the early game, military and intrigue challenges are better to whittle down your opponent's resources, keeping them in check as power trickles in via the dominance mechanic or through unopposed challenges. But as the game picks up, battles get larger and characters with power collecting traits like Renown or Infamy can make for large game stealing moves, increasing the stakes of each attack phase and making the endgame exciting. Commanding these large battles is fun as you try to balance which forces to send in and which to hold back for defense so your gains aren't immediately taken by another house. You're the general in this war for the fate of the land, and constantly on the lookout for plot twists that may turn the tide of battle. Okay, so I don't want to be all cliche and say winter is coming, but uh, maybe you should put on a sweater because it's about to get cold. White Raven. You just killed Gilly. She was weak. So everyone has to discard down to four cards now. Oh, no, not way. cool. And you, we all get one less gold every turn. Eat a dick. Hot sauce. Some cherry on top. Hey, times are tough for me too, okay? It's winter. We're all suffering here. Don't you get all kinds of benefits when it's winter? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're quite toasty over here in Winterfell, uh, which incidentally increases my claims by one now. You guys are so screwed. Hearts. Okay, intrigue challenge you with Varys? Uh, you can't. Uh, I have Catelyn Stark. Opponents may not declare intrigue challenges against you during winter. Fine, I power challenge you with Gregor Clegane. Okay, I will block with Arya and Sansa Stark. Rob Stark's ability gives them each plus two strength during winter. So, I win. The mountain got beat up by two little girls? Fucking winter. Uh, if it's winter, it does not yield to defend. Uh, it's winter, so I can discard one location from play. And during winter, opponents must surrender their pants. Why aren't you upset about any of this? He took our pants! Mm, I have a bunch of stuff that's good in winter, too. What? Yeah, look. Balon Greyjoy gets plus two strength during winter. Theon Greyjoy, if you win a challenge during winter, kill another character. Ice Fisherman, steal opponent's gold during winter. Yeah, winter's awesome. <sighs> The game can be played with as few as two players, and although it remains fun, you miss out on some of the engaging multiplayer combat strategy, and the titles, which are absent in the two-player rules. A Game of Thrones LCG's biggest strength is its political maneuvering and the outstanding conversion of source flavor into exciting gameplay mechanics. For example, Skycell is a character attachment that constrains a player by forcing them to randomly choose their plots for the rest of the game. However, at any time the player can choose to kill the character in the Skycell, having them jump to their death and releasing them from the prison. If you have an event called No Use for Grief, when the Red Viper dies, you can search your deck for every Sand Snake you have and put them all directly into play. If the Martells know how to do anything, it's Get Revenge. The Hound is very strong for his cost, but retreats back to your hand if any character's strength is lowered. And as you may notice, cards that lower a character's strength are all fire-related. Flavor fucking win. Speaking of fire-related, Valar Morghulis, motherfucker! Really, dude? I've had it with your unholy sex alliance. Give me my pants back. Yeah, well, you can have them, okay? But we're married, okay? You see this? This is a symbol of the unbreakable vows that we made to each other. Property of greencardmatchmaker.com? You know what? It doesn't matter, okay? Because now you've left yourself open and your own hubris will be your downfall. So you forgot Arya Stark was hiding in shadows the entire time. Fueled by the death of her family, Arya Stark sets out on a quest for vengeance against House Lannister, using her stealth to bypass her meager defenses. I'll use my title to redirect your attack against House Targaryen. What? Ooh, I'll block with my army of dragons. No! I win. And since all my participating characters were dragons, they each gain one power. No! And I kill Arya Stark, and burn Winterfell to the ground. Arya! Why would you do that? Because now I can attack you and win the game. That's great for you. 
Yeah, you didn't think she would betray you at a pivotal point and destroy Winterfell while you were off making war? Isn't that exactly what Theon did? Oh my god. Wow! Flavor win? She didn't just win. She flavor raped me! She flavor murdered me! She flavor killed my children! <laughs>